So I think we'll get started. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Janice Shaw. I'm, I'm the president and CEO of Testing.io, uh, which is an AI-based test automation platform. I'm super excited to host the team from Abstracta. There's, there's very few companies I've worked with that have the practical experience that Abstracta has. Um, I've, I've personally worked with hundreds of accounts and, uh, and I can think of a handful uh, that would love those pieces of advice that we're about to share. So, um, so again, a very exciting webinar and one that many of our customers have actually asked for. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. I'll start with uh, Lucia. Lucia, do you want to take a minute to me? Hi, Shani. Thank you so much for, for having us today. Um, so I'm, I'm Lucia. Uh, I'm an account manager here at Abstracta. Uh, I've been working with the company for the past um, three years and uh, mainly handling now our sales um, initiatives and uh, all of, uh, everything that has to do with customer facing relationships. So I work with all of our accounts in, in the US. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much me. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Uh, for the Rico, uh, maybe you want to take a minute and introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, everyone. Hello, Shani. Uh, my name is Federico. I'm one of the co-founders of Abstracta. I've been working in software testing for almost 15 years now. And well, I'm passionate about agile methodologies, CI, CD, DevOps, and everything. So I really enjoy learning and sharing knowledge about the topic. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity, Shani. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining. And I, you know, with 15 years, I look forward to your insights. And uh, um, maybe for those who are not familiar with Abstracta, um, yeah, maybe you want to give a few words about Abstracta? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our company is um, completely dedicated to quality engineering and, and software quality. Um, we've been around for 10 years. Uh, we have offices in Latin America and in the US. And when we are completely dedicated to, to testing, so we help our organizations uh, implement the right um, quality engineering practices and execute their processes to help them achieve a, a, higher, um, a higher quality on delivery. Um, so part of our services are um, testing consulting services, we do training and we do custom uh, tool development as well in the, all dedicated to testing, right? Uh, so we build automation tools and um, just add on to their teams to help them reach um, their testing goals. Cool, awesome. Uh, again, great, uh, great having you here. So uh, maybe just to, before we get started, I'll say a few words about myself and about testing. Um, so as mentioned, I'm currently the president and CEO of Testing.io. Um, in the quality domain. Uh, for a fair number of years and, uh, and in kind of the development space for, uh, for software development for most of my career. I'm an engineer by background, so I've always been on the intersection of uh, uh, technology and, uh, and business. Um, started about six ventures, including one VC fund, so I've seen both sides of the story. Um, graduate of the Stanford Business School and um, yeah, super passionate about uh, quality and software development. Uh, a little bit about uh, testing IO. Uh, so essentially a testing we create tests that learn. Uh, we have a platform that leverage artificial intelligence uh, uh, and what we call dynamic locators uh, to create tests that are uh, stable and learning the changes in the application. So uh, while working with QA teams throughout the world, we discovered that, uh, um, you know, whoever's kind of making a transformation to automation usually leverages Selenium. Selenium is a great framework. We use it under the hood. But the biggest challenge with Selenium is the flakiness of tests and the fact that uh, um, you can't really rely on, I mean, most organizations that we work with can't really rely on the results. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that uh, Selenium is a 20-year-old framework and uh, organizations are now developing in an agile way with constant code changes. And so uh, uh, so what we did at Testim is essentially we leverage dynamic locators that learn the changes in the applications and adapt. A byproduct of what we do is that uh, the authoring is super fast and usually in less than an hour 
Um, you can create a test. We have customers that have created as much as 150 tests in a given month. Um, we're not a codeless tool, so the idea is that they can use custom code when, uh, when you need complex logic and edge cases, but code becomes 1% of your test as opposed to 100% of your test. Um, that's it. As a company, we're running over 1 million tests every month. We uh, over 100 customers. The more notable one includes uh, USA Today, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Swisscom, Walmart, Verizon, NetApp, Autodesk, LogMeIn, uh, Forrester, and many, many others. Um, so that's a little bit about, uh, about testing. Um, cool. So uh, with that, I think we'll 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 dive right in. Um, so the purpose of uh, this discussion is to talk a little bit about some of the mistakes that uh, uh, that we've seen customers make. I um, when transforming to CI/CD, I you know I think if I were to bucket the eight mistakes, and again we'll dive into each one in a second. Uh, kind of the overarching theme is uh, is focusing on the technicality and the tools as opposed to the people and the organization. Um, uh, for the or see, I don't know if, um, would that be a right classification? Well, yes, there's a, there's a lot of um, changes and a, a lot of um, adoptions that need to happen from an organization perspective that, that uh, uh, involve the human side of things and the and the mindset of the of the company. So it's uh, it has to be uh, clear from the very start that a big change in culture is going to have to happen as well, right? Yeah, culture processes, um, uh, setting right expectations, and again, stuff that we'll we'll get into in a second. So, uh, so with that, maybe let's just dive into the first one. Um, um, and Lucia, maybe maybe you want to talk a little, about, a little bit about that. But uh, just like any other change, management buying is super important. Um, I don't know if you have any experience with implementing the ICD bottom up as opposed to top down. But uh, um, yeah, I'd love to hear your perspective. Yes, um, I was I was actually recently uh, attending Jenkins World and DevOps World in San Francisco, and this was one of the very recurring topics uh, among conversations I had, as well as some of the uh, keynotes and, and panels that I attended. Um, it, it's not that common to see cases where the adoption of DevOps is being driven from the top down, um, but the the problem is when implementing it bottom up, there needs there, there has to be a point where the team can reach uh, an executive buy-in. Um, otherwise, the project may gain some uh, temporary momentum, but it's unlikely that it will be sustainable over time, right? Um, without this support and vision from, from an upper management, uh, it will be hard to move forward. And the, the adoption may only get to a partial point. Um, we do consider it better than doing nothing at all because we still can implement some practices that will help the team. Um, but it's great if we can get the visibility of the team's success to management so that this will have support to adopt these practices uh, among other teams in the organization. Um, in the cases of seeing uh, experiences bottom up, we've had some cases where we've seen it in clients um, in a successful way in the cases that they could showcase the value of their of their adoption to their management team. And a, a case that comes to mind is uh, this governmental agency that we work with. Because of the nature of their organization, which is quite rigid, it's very rare to see a, an adoption, like these kind of actions to happen top down. So what happened in this case is the technical team sort of got aligned and synced up uh, in terms of implementing CI, uh, adopting these practices in the, in, the, in the search of adopting a DevOps culture. Uh, and what happened or some of the key benefits that they could gather to present to their management as a result of these changes were finding issues uh, in a, earlier in the process, uh, in uh, being able to promote, like to, to identify risks earlier in the processes uh, they were doing frequent code uh, reviews, uh, and that allowed them to to have better visibility of these issues in a, in, a, in an earlier stage. Um, 
they could also implement a test strategy in, a, in the correct way uh, that allowed them to have a clear process that they could follow, they could have uh, some uh, metrics that they could track and that allowed them to improve the process. Uh, so it's a, a lot of the things that management uh, identified were risks being identified and reduced. Yeah. So you're saying it might um, it might get triggered bottom up, but at the end of the day, it's a transformation, and a transformation requires a management buy-in because um, it's about skill set, it's about people, it's about processes, uh, and uh, and a lot of things that again management needs to. Um, uh, needs to allocate the time and resources and the attention to. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, in certain way, in certain moment, you have to convince the the, the upper levels, right? The the management to to adopt something. And I mean, the, the, you you can convince your 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 team, but after certain point, you have to convince you convince the the management as well. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, great point. So management buying is super important. You might be able to initiate uh, the process bottom up, but uh, but at some point you gotta involve the management if you really want uh, a sustainable transition to CI/CD. Um, so so with that, I'll I'll move to the second mistake, uh, which uh, which we'd like to cover today, which is. Uh, the cultural changes and the shift in mindset. So, Federico, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that, and specifically the mindset shift. I think that's that's a good component. Yeah, sure. Um, if you can show the follow slide, there is a, an image that I really like uh, from from Dan Ashby. Uh, there, you can see that there is no a specific activity for testing. I mean, uh, testing should be part of every single task, making it a, a, a continuous activity. It's, it's part of everything that we that we do, and maybe part of the mind shift, the mindset shift that we should do is like is related to that. Uh, the testing should be something that everyone in the team is doing all the time, in as part of their of all of their activities. And as I said, it's not something uh, that only the testers will do that. Uh, for instance, the, the developers have to, to write unit tests and also write the code for testability with the testability in mind. So the quality is established from the start. Um, the culture is, a, is key for seeing collaboration and communication. You may, you might have to, to invest in your people and provide additional training for that. An example may be as simple as changing titles from being a QA to being a tester or a quality engineer. You know, it sounds silly maybe, but uh, if you say that you are a the QA, the person who is responsible for assuring the quality, you are giving the wrong message. Another important shift is related to establish a uh, feedback culture. In, in DevOps, for, for me, in DevOps, the most important thing is related to, to this uh, way of seeing things. It's like you, you have to provide and, and receive feedback constantly. Uh, you cannot say that you are doing Scrum, but without retrospective meetings, right? We, we are talking here about CI, CD, but uh, this is part of the same thing. Probably if we are trying to adopt CI, CD, we are adopting a, a, an agile me me methodology because you, you don't consider to adopt continuous delivery if you are doing, a, a, if you are following a, a waterfall approach, right? In Agile, particularly in, in Scrum, the retros, the retrospective meetings, are fundamental for getting teams to get used to giving and receiving feedback, uh, allowing for continuous improvement. When we help teams uh, to adopt an Agile methodology, the first thing we do is a retrospective. In the first retro, typically, 
one of the action items is to set up a recurrent retro meeting every two weeks. So in that way, adopting this uh, idea of, uh, of constant, constant uh, of continu continuous feedback. Well, another uh, aspect that is really important is to be aligned in terms of quality, in what quality means for, for the team, for each team member. The question is when, when we see an item in the in the column in, in our Kanban board in the done column, what do we understand was already done for that item? Is there a common understanding of the definition of done? Can we assume that the item was tested and how it was tested? Uh, or can you as assume that someone reviewed the code or, or what, what else? For, for me, the definition of done is a very powerful tool to share this understanding about the quality standards of what we produce and how we produce it. It tells about our process, including how we implement CI/CD. If we add a, a new feature, uh, the question is, are we adding also the corresponding automated test that will run after uh, each build in the continuous integration engine? For me, this is something critical. The definition of done provides visibility and most importantly, trust. And this is part of the mindset shift that I consider that we should uh, contribute to. If, we, if it is not clear, we must define it uh, between the different members of the team and make it visible, reviewable, and accessible to, to everyone, including uh, the, the product owner or, or even the client. Perfect. I don't know if with this you, you you have an idea of more or less of what I I don't know the, the main aspects I believe we should take into consideration for for this uh, shift in our mindsets. Yeah, I I can think of one organization uh, uh, that we've worked with uh, um, called Engageo. Uh, there's actually some. Uh, some videos out there, so I, you know, I can share some of the details. But, uh, but essentially, the VP engineering decided uh, he was spearheading the initiative uh, to transition to CI/CD. Um, you know, he literally allocated time on uh, on every sprint for those activities. They had uh, they set up dashboards to constantly monitor quality throughout the different stages of their development. Um, and, you know, they allocated time specifically for uh, for writing tests during the development process. Um, and so um, I, I think it was one of the uh, more successful transformations that I've seen, uh, um, you know, including a, an initial blitz on the first, uh, the first two sprints. So, um, you know, that goes back to a lot of the things that you, uh, that you mentioned, uh, Federico. Great. Cool. Uh, so moving forward, I think just like with any transformation, uh, uh, you know, transformation should be measured and should have, uh, tangible goals. So, uh, um, Lucia, maybe you want to talk a little bit about how you define those goals, how you make sure that they're realistic, and how you track them throughout the process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, in, when defining goals, it's uh, it's very important to think where, where the organization is at at the moment, right? Um, if the team is, is releasing currently once a month, maybe we can think of cutting down that time in half to two weeks. It, it's not really possible to become Amazon and release every 12 seconds, right? Um, so we need to think where we are today and uh, at a very minimum think about assessing our operating reality. Uh, another goal for that same scenario, if we're releasing once a month, could be we will keep releasing once a month, but we will do it with better quality and reducing risks. Um, so in thinking, in thinking of the goals, we don't only need to think about what's a realistic goal and we, what 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 what's something that we can achieve, but also 
what will make sense for us today? Uh, so we need to think of goals that are adjusted to our current context. Um, and some as aspects that we can consider for these are um, how frequently our users need new versions or new adjustments or fixes. There are some contexts, for example, where it won't make sense to release more than three times in a year, uh, and, and that's fine. Uh, in these cases, why would we add uh, an over-engineering to our processes when they're not going to add value? So we need to think uh, what's going to make sense, right? And in, and in this same line of thinking, we need to think what's going to be the best solution for a particular organization. Uh, what, what fits for me? Is it continuous delivery or is it continuous integration? And that's going to be enough. Uh, this could be the cases of highly regulated organizations like, I don't know, banks or uh, healthcare industry uh, companies where they might have a certification of the product needed. So maybe in, in these cases, continuous integration could be the goal. And in, in my opinion, continuous integration should be the must for every team. So uh, when, when we start using it, we, we can't stop, right? And we, we, we don't, we can't think of a way of living without it. <laughs> but continuous delivery, is something that will need us to change the way we deliver software as it impacts our, our users, our, our business, um, and the way we handle operations. So before trying to approach this, it's good to take some time to consider if, if, if the, what is the added value that it will have, it will provide our organization and evaluate if it makes sense for us today. So our, I think these are some of the things to consider when setting uh, what the goal for, for the change will be. Cool, awesome. Is um, um, the organization that you've worked with, have you seen them more focus on initially on CI or CD? Normally we start with CI, uh, but that's, that's the, the starting point. Uh, once we're there, we start thinking, uh, can we start releasing a bit faster? Does it make sense? We try it for a couple of sprints uh, and measure and evaluate how that's working. Um, so we can make a like a long-term plan for that. Okay. And do they usually measure? Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I, I would say that few companies work uh, with proper continuous delivery in place, but uh, most of them work with continuous integration, and, and that's fine for them. Uh, it's enough. Uh, I mean, uh, you. You have to evaluate if you really, as, as Lucia mentioned before, uh, you, you have to evaluate if it really makes sense for you and your business to implement continuous delivery. Sure. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Uh, and other than the frequency of release, uh, do you also track, um, you know, quality measurements, uh, number of bugs that slip for production or, um, Yeah, and, and, and there are other metrics that we, we, we look at. Um, in terms of quality, there are a lot of things that we can see, what the coverage we have, um, the amount of bugs that are going, and the criticality of the bugs that are going into production as well is important. Um, the time that it takes for us to identify it and fix it is also something that, that can be reduced a lot with this. Uh, one of the main goals of, of this CI, and as, as Fede was saying before, a, a continuous feedback culture is being able to identify these things as early as possible. So if we can get to the point that where we introduce a line of code that is impacting quality, uh, we want to know that as soon as possible and being able to fix it as soon as possible. Great point. Um, cool. So let's say we, we set up some measurable goals. Um, you know, just like anything, uh, you know, you need to build also a tangible plan and uh, and get into the weed. So, um, so maybe Federico, you want to talk a little bit about how you define that plan and uh, you know what you need to take into consideration, how you set deadlines. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I I believe that. It's uh, really difficult to, to make a plan for something that implies much research and the adoption of different new tools. Um, if you, if we see, if you, if we pay attention to the following uh, slide, we can see uh, an image that really represents of the the concept of continuous integration. Just to to uh, be clear of what we consider uh, continuous integration is. 
basically, we have a separate server where, uh, which is fetching the new changes from the source control. Uh, and it makes a new build and tests it every, for every change uh, in the code. And we do that frequently. I mean, not uh, every two or three days, frequently, at least once a day, or, or if, if it's possible, uh, even, even more frequently. And uh, when we prepare the build automatically, we run the different tests that we have uh, prepared, and we have a notification for every member of the team saying if, the, if anything went wrong or everything is okay with the, with the new build. This is part of the continuous feedback. We, we can see these this, uh, feedback loops here as well. And well, with, something important is that we can do this uh, regardless if we are following a waterfall approach or if we are trying to achieve continuous del uh, delivery or even continuous deployment. This is like the, the first uh, step. So I think that, that, that the key here is to, to work on that uh, in, in different steps, like uh, doing different MVPs. Uh, so the question maybe is, uh, what is a, an MVP for, for this? Which, uh, what, what thing makes sense that add, adds value to, the, to my delivery pipeline? So the, the first goal could be continuous integration, maybe starting with, starting with the automation of the build, uh, some unit tests, and after that, we can evaluate and plan the next MVP, adding some other uh, automation to, to the process. Once we have CI in place, we could try to make it continuous delivery into a staging environment. I mean, we, we need to test the process, right? We are, uh, as, as testers, <laughs> we, we need to get trust on the, on the delivery process in, in the automation that we are preparing here. Because there, there is a big risk on, on that. So we, we could think in, in just the, the boundaries of this process, uh, what could be wrong, what if something goes wrong, is the pipeline configured configure it correctly to match this situation. So, so I think this, is good. this could be a, a second step uh, towards when, when we are defining a plan for that. And just after, after that, uh, we, we should analyze if we need, uh, if, we, if we want to, to have continuous delivery to our users, um, if it makes sense for our business, as Lucia mentioned before. Um, if, it, if it makes sense, we can start with one release per sprint or one release per week, uh, whatever better fits uh, our team. There are also some things to consider when defining your pipeline, and that's where a tester can add a, a lot of value and ideas uh, about the verifications we can add to, to the testing process. <coughs> um, or, or also, who is going to prepare uh, each test or in which environment we are running those tests. It's like the, the definition of the pipeline. Of the pipeline, I think the tester can contribute a lot in, in this uh, strategy. I, I really like a, um, having a, a process where each developer runs automated tests in different levels, like unit tests, API, UI, in their own branch, and after that they ask for a merge request and someone else uh, does a code review. And after that, uh, we run all the tests in a fresh environment, in a just generated environment for uh, the, the main branch. Um, there you can include not only unit uh, API and UI tests, but also we can include performance verification or security checks or a 
accessibility tools to find issues related to to well to accessibility of our interfaces and, and these kind of things. To sum up, I will follow an agile approach for for that in terms of planning. I mean, a, a series of MVPs organized in different sprints, adding different levels of automation to our uh, delivery pipeline. Starting, starting with continuous integration, uh, and after that, automate the deploy, the deploys to our station environment in order to decide if we are comfortable with that and we want to try this uh, directly to our users. I cannot tell about timing, about the things, because it depends a lot on the technologies or the tools you use and also on the skills of your team. Perfect. Thanks for the call. One thing that I'll add, I think the you know you always take you always need to take cost and uh, into account when you're building that process. So one thing that I've seen is companies uh, uh, constantly segment their test into buckets and uh, and essentially run different buckets at different stages in the development process. So uh, I mean you you can run your regression your entire. Um, uh, regression suite on every commit or every merge, but if you do that, unless you have uh, you know a really robust environment, then it's going to take some time to get the feedback back to the developers. Uh, so what many companies do is they they run a small subset inside the branch, and uh, and once they merge to master, they run a sanity suite, um, uh, which is. You know, we bust enough, but still such that uh, that that you can give the developer feedback in a few minutes, and uh, uh, and then once a night the one the the one full regression. Um, we actually follow that practice as well, and so uh, uh, just to trade off the cost of infrastructure with uh, with kind of um, uh, the uh, the agility that you want to achieve. Yeah, and, and also uh, this is very aligned with what we were saying before related to the, the continuous feedback because probably you need to, you can establish an initial process and after that you have to evaluate how to improve it. So this is part of the, that, that's why continuous delivery is also very related and very aligned with the agile methodologies. We have to start with something simple, adding value, and after that, evaluate and see what to modify next, or what to add, what to add next. Uh, constantly evaluating and getting feedback from, from the teams, from the users, from other teams, or, uh, and uh, it's like a continuous learning process as well. Yeah. Cool. Uh, for Rico, maybe maybe you want to talk about the next one as well. So uh, so now you know each plan includes different people, different roles. Uh, so how do you uh, you know how do you uh, manage the the role changes, the responsibilities? Um, you know, is the one person that's responsible for the entire transformation? Uh, you know, different people, everyone on the team. How do you manage that? Yeah, uh, well, I think first we, we should figure out what are the processes and people and tools and technology you need to reach uh, to reach your, your, your goals. Uh, what continues to stay the course, uh, what needs to be modified, what gets eliminated, then what gets added. Or not, not, not everything needs a complete overhaul. I consider that CI/CD is very aligned with the agile way of working, as I said before. So, uh, if you are used to work like this, I don't see many changes in the roles uh, and responsibilities. If you are not being agile, in my humble opinion, uh, you need to adapt that first. First of all, the main man mindset that needs to change it is, is that quality is the responsibility of the whole team. Otherwise, you, you will have a, a test team, which is a quality gate. It, it, it will work as a quality gate with a generated conflict of interest with the development team. 
we testers and developers belong to the same team and we have to the same goal the which is deliver quality software right everyone participates in different ways in, in this process and everyone decides what is the best way to deliver uh, regarding technology it is essential to, to use a git based repository and one needs to automate the process from the changes in the repo in the repo to the deploy including all the automated automatic checks in the middle the building process um, and so on we need to, to understand the process everyone in the team because once we see that something went wrong we will need to track all the steps in these uh, automations. Um, I think that continuous delivery is also about getting feedback from users, uh, not only from, from the tools with the automatic checks, you know, uh, for example, checking the, 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 the logs to see if the just release version added any, uh, any negative impact to the performance or to the functionality. We need to get familiar with the APM tools to see if there, there is any change in the way the, the resources of the servers are being used, or if there, there is a, a new exception appearing in the, in the log or in the, or, or a new JavaScript error or something like this. There are beautiful tools to help process this information. Um, there are tons of them. Uh, the thing is, you, you not only have to deliver, you have to measure in order to realize if, if you have to adapt something, you have just released. Again, we are talking about continuous feedback loops, right? Yeah, I, I think many people in the audience can definitely relate to the fact that quality is uh, not the responsibility of QA, but actually the whole team. I uh, think that's, uh, that's, that's super important. Yeah, and, and it's a typical confusion eh? and something that it's really hard to change from the traditional way of working because the, this conflict of interest between developers and, and, and testers was something that was made on purpose, right? And we have to break this uh, way of thinking. <laughs> we have to change it. Yeah, this is this is also the mindset shift that you spoke about earlier. I think the you know in waterfall, each uh, each team has its own its own responsibility. But uh, but you know when you agile and especially when uh, when you want to test throughout the development process, then uh, you know naturally again QA is not just the responsibility or quality is not just the responsibility of the QA team. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a mindset shift. That's not just uh, a technical shift in terms of uh, developers, uh, you know, owning code quality. I like, I like how you correct yourself and you <laughs> change the world QA to quality because well, we, we have to start doing that, right? Like uh, stop using the word QA because we are not assuring the quality. We are uh, helping the team in terms of quality. We are helping to, to in different ways, uh, to improve the quality of what we are delivering. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, I, when I think of our customer base, about 30% of our users are actually developers. So I think that's, uh, uh, that, that's a good sign in terms of, uh, again, quality being the responsibility of the entire team. Um, uh, at the same time, I still feel like, uh, you know, shift left at least is uh, something that's, uh, you know, much more spoken about than, uh, than practiced, but, but I think we're, you know, we're, we're getting there. So, uh, so that's, um, you know, I don't know, that, that's my feel from, uh, from the market. Okay. Cool. So with that, uh, uh, maybe let's uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the uh, the technical requirements. I think we spoke a lot about uh, uh, people and processes, and we're going to get get back to that in a second. But let's talk a little bit about the 
the technical requirements, how do you determine the technical requirements, uh, tools? Uh, Lucia, I don't know if you want to take that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I, I do think a, a, an important first step here is understanding where we are today. So uh, based on that, we can plan what needs to change and what we need to involve. Um, and the plan will also be linked, of course, to our goals and the expectations of what we're trying to achieve, as we mentioned before. Um, it's going to be aligned with our plan. Uh, but so again, you mentioned technology, like they're very linked together, right? They're, these are the three pillars that we're going to have to, to assess and to look at and how they interact together. Uh, and in, in, in doing this, we, we can assess the maturity of our team. Uh, and in this case, thinking, thinking of the testing team and our testing maturity, which is a, a huge driver towards uh, CI, CD and DevOps, we, at Abstracta, we have put together our own like testing maturity model. Um, we have identified three main levels of, of testing maturity um, based on, on three basic components, which are like the risks, the quality and the costs. Um, and we, we, we have sort of charted down what the, what the things we consider are needed in order to lay the foundations for efficient testing which is what we think is uh, the maturity level, level in which we can achieve CICD. Um, so here, for example, we can see uh, on the slide what, what we consider are the, the, basic, uh, the basic components needed uh, to achieve basic testing, let's say. So we've divided it for, uh, between different areas of quality, right? Um, so different things that we need to do or activities that need to happen in terms of source code. For example, we need to have some versioning. We need to have separate environments uh, in which we can test and know where we're testing, tracking our bugs, um, have basic at least the test management and planning, having different uh, functionality inventories, like knowing what we're tracking, knowing what we're testing, and having a track uh, of traceability between our, our test cases and our features. Um, in terms of automation, at least have some unit testing in place and uh, test on an API level, um, some sort of performance and security. Uh, and then if we move on to the next slide, there are some things that we can add uh, in the process of achieving a, a more efficient way of testing where we're controlling the risk. We're, like before we just know where they are, here we're trying to, to control the risk and the quality. Uh, so we start doing some code quality control at the source level. Uh, we do more coverage in terms of um, testing. We have more data management. We might even have separate environments added at this point. And then we have some recommendations so things we don't think are specifically needed to achieve this but if we might want to start doing some causal analysis of our bugs uh doing an impact of the analysis of the, of the bugs that are coming do more prioritized testing and in the automation side of things involve more end-to-end -end testing so at a ui level we can start involving selenium tests uh, doing some uh, add more adding more unit tests so for us this is the uh, the point where we think um CICD can take place. So if you move to the following slide, uh, which would be continuous testing, it, we would achieve a, a point where we have CI in place, maybe continuous delivery, depending on your needs, but then we'll have a set of unit API and automated tests that are running continuously. So we achieve this point where we have this um, continuous feedback loop and it's all part of an automated process and it's all happening uh, all the time. So we're reducing risks we're optimizing the quality and, and the cost. So for us, this, this has been sort of a, um, a way to set up uh, all the activities that need to happen and um, defining some preconditions of when it's happened before. before. So this allows to have a, a broad um, overview of, of how our technology landscape looks like in different aspects of quality. And it will help us determine which activities we need to involve in the team uh, and in the process, of course. Perfect. So, uh, so with that, I think uh, let's move to um, specifically test automation and uh, and kind of how you how you set your test automation strategy as part of the the, the CI CD transformation. So, um, um, Lucia, maybe maybe you want to take that. Yes, absolutely. So, well, one of the 
mistakes that can happen uh, in, in, in when thinking about the test automation is uh, wanting to involve automation and thinking we need to automate everything and have everything running all the time. So this this might not be necessary. So it's important to define a clear strategy uh, for how we're going to tackle automation. Um, if we move to the next slide, I think we have a, an image that's going to help with this. Uh, we tend to base our automation strategies a lot on, on the guidelines proposed by Mike Tavocon, and this is um, known as the test automation pyramid. Uh, so the, the idea here is to di distribute our efforts um, across different levels of tests. Uh, so at the base of the pyramid, we will have um, our unit tests, and the aim is to devote more efforts to this kind of test because they are the faster to execute, they're easy to maintain and to manage, and they they allow us to detect errors beforehand. So it's a, the developer should be in charge of, of writing these whenever we're adding a new feature, and this will help us shorten the life the lifetime of, of the bugs. Uh, it allows to allows to reduce costs and uh, avoiding rework by, by our team members. Like the second we introduce the bug to the code, it might jump up in the in the unit tests. Um, if we move to a, a next level, we would put big efforts, but a, a bit smaller, I guess, uh, at the at the middle level of automation at the service level, so API testing. And here we will test only the most critical workflows. Um, so the, the idea is to test the logic before we get to UI. So by the time at an API level, we'll have a bit slower tests, but they're still quicker than, than UI tests. So it will provide a good feedback of how uh, different services are, are working. And then we'll get to the top of the pyramid and automate tests at a UI level. So these are the slowest and, and harder to maintain, but they will help us validate an end-to-end -end functionality. So uh, complex flows, uh, and, and it will give us a complete perspective of how the functionality is working. And this, this will replicate how a user would use our system as well. So, when we get to this point and we have like the, the good base of unit, uh, a, a good base of acceptance uh, and, and API tests and some UI levels, we still need some time for manual and exploratory testing, but at this point it will reduce this time a lot. And we'll, we'll already get to the point of running manual tests with a lot of feedback uh, that the automated tests provide. Um, and the other important thing is, uh, putting efforts in the in keeping a, a, a maintained or a, an updated test, to, uh, test test suites. So we need to make sure that we can rely on our test results. Um, so this is a bit focused on, on functional testing, I guess. Uh, on the performance side of things, uh, we could also think of adding some unit performance checks to the pipeline as well. Yeah, and, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll add a couple of things because this is a very frequent question that we get from uh, from a lot of our customers, and we actually wrote uh, a couple of uh, blog posts that I think the audience would find interesting. But uh, um, one, uh, you know, I uh, a lot of the customers we talked to initially don't believe in doing uh, functional testing or end-to-end -end testing um, you know because they've done that in other companies in the past and it just became very hard to maintain i think this is uh this is where actually testing is uh testing or io is actually changing a little bit that you know that paradigm and uh I'm, I'm proud to say that i think a lot of our customers probably believe in back in uh, functional testing and end-to-end -end testing um yeah, in terms of uh, prioritizing, what we recommend to many of our customers is to take a risk-based approach instead of trying to boil the ocean. Uh, you know, focus on what has the biggest ROI. So whether it's uh, um, user flows that are critical in your system. For example, if you are an e-commerce site, then you definitely want to make sure that there's nothing screwed up in your checkout process because uh, that would have a direct impact on your business. Uh, if you're a search engine, then, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, search functionality should uh, should work properly. Um, um, you know, if you're a travel site, etc. And so definitely, you know, focus on the user scenarios that are critical to your business and the user scenarios that are critical to, um, uh, to the user experience. 
one other thing that we started noticing and um, and and uh, Lucia Federico, feel free to chime in if you've seen it differently. But I think larger organizations are putting more more focus um, once they have a good baseline. They're starting to put more focus on kind of the visual aspect of the application because um, I think now these days there's much more attention to the user experience and uh, the look and feel of applications. So um, I, I don't know if you if you're seeing the same uh, for vehicles here. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have seen uh, uh, different kind of tools uh, are able to... Can you hear me right? Yeah, you're, you're cutting off in the last uh, 10 seconds. Okay, uh, what I've seen, what I was saying is that there are a lot of tools to add different checks to the pipeline. Uh, visual checks or performance or security or accessibility. There are different quality factors that you can start checking in your pipeline and that's right. And uh, for all of them, uh, I think it's important to have in mind what you have just mentioned, which is risk-based approach. Uh, because it, as there are a lot of tools, we, we have a lot of things to to prepare and to and to maintain. So it's really important to, to pay attention to what is really adding value to our pipeline, uh, which uh, is contributing to uh, assess or to avoid risks. So this is something that we have to, to think about all the time. Great. In a second, we'll open it up for the audience and one would love to hear a little bit about some of the challenges that you've uh, uh, that you're experiencing in the transition to CICD and also open it up to questions. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just take one last mistake that, uh, that I think we, you know, is critical to avoid in the transformation to CICD, which is KPIs and how do you measure success. And, uh, and Federico, you talked about a little bit um, uh, prior to that, uh, you know, kind of measure it throughout the process. and. And, and pivot if needed. Um, so maybe I'll let you kind of take a step at that one. Yeah, sure. Um, well, what I've seen, particularly in CI CD context, uh, that we should pay attention to is related to different metrics uh, associated to, to our delivery pipeline. Um, and for me, the most important question is how much time does it take for a change to be in the user's hand? Uh, I think this is the most important thing related to continuous delivery. And of course, if our team feels confident about the, uh, releasing the software that way, the simplest change, I mean, how, how much it takes to, to, to make a simple change and uh, deliver that to our users. With that information, we can we can start seeing uh, or, and thinking how we can reduce this number. Um, there is a book that I, I would like to suggest you to read, which is uh, Continuous Delivery from Jess Humble and David Farley. They explain this, uh, what I mentioned uh, very well. Uh, there are some metrics related to the lean methodology, uh, which which are lead time and cycle time. Those are related to how much time we need, uh, how much time it takes from the idea to the delivery of the implementation to that idea to the users. <clears throat> and then there are some other metrics that are important. Uh, Regardless if we are doing continuous delivery or not, but we still have to pay attention to that. It's like uh, how well uh, will your users write your software or how happy is your team with the way they are important KPIs. Um, if you need a dashboard, you have the CI engine, uh, with more information related to the technical aspects of the continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. 
uh, like the cold coverage, the tests that are passing or failing, um, or the response times, or I don't know, different, different technical things. But the, the important thing that, uh, that always should be uh, in mind is how much time uh, it takes to deliver value. But thinking in, 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 the original, in, the, in the original problem that you mentioned, I think we have to answer how fast we need to implement that change and measure and measure basically measure that. This is the, the, the measure of our success implementing CICD. Great. Thanks, Rico. In, in a second, we'll open it up for questions. So, uh, if anyone has questions, use the chat box to um, uh, to ask those, and uh, and we'll take them one by one. Uh, in the meantime, you know, I'd love to hear what's been your biggest challenge in uh, transforming to CI/CD. So, we spoke about a couple of challenges, but uh, uh, you know, would love to uh, would love to hear your feedback. So, um, so there's a quick poll. Uh, we'll take a minute to uh, see the responses. Okay. Okay, so we're seeing that uh, words is very important. Uh, KPIs is definitely getting a lot of uh, uh, a lot of votes there. Okay, we'll give it another twenty seconds. Um, we also have uh, an interesting uh, uh, giveaway at the end of the webinar, so uh, so stay with us. Uh, we'll announce that in about one minute. Okay, uh, we're just about to close the poll, so uh, if you haven't voted, you have another 10 seconds to vote. Great participation. I think most people have voted already. Awesome. So we'll we'll close the polls. Uh, it's actually it's a very very interesting results. Uh, um, but what we're seeing is that um, actually it's split pretty evenly between the the different um, um, between the different results. So uh, um, about 52% says that uh, the cultural change and mindset is uh, has been the biggest challenge, and, and that's kind of number one. Um, about 40% said that either the transition, uh, confusion, and wall changes have been the biggest challenge, or not establishing the right KPI. So that's uh, evenly, that's breaking uh, uh, pretty evenly between the two. And then uh, um, effective test automation strategy, about 32% mentioned that as the biggest challenge. And, uh, um, and so I'm pretty sure that's, uh, that's, that's where we can probably help. So, um, um, okay, here you go. So uh, uh, definitely there's not, uh, there's not one challenge that uh, stands out, but it seems like uh, everybody, everybody experienced the same, uh, the same challenges. So, uh, uh, cool. So with that, we'll open it up for questions. And while we do that, we'd love to hear your uh, your feedback about the webinar. Um, you know, love to hear how insightful this webinar was for you. If though, if you know, the, we had uh, set the right expectations, um, did you find the information valuable enough to take back to your organization? Um, anything that we could have done differently, would love uh, would love your feedback. So, um, and while we do that, uh, my suggestion is let's uh, let's open it up for um, a quick uh, one or two questions. Just before we do that, 
uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're, we, we have a quick uh, giveaway. And so uh, um, we're going to select five people from the audience uh, who feel like they need help with the, the, with the CI CD transformation. And we're actually going to have a one on one consulting session uh, with the obstructor and the testing team uh, to help them out with some of those challenges and provide them with some. Uh, with some tools and experience and so uh, uh, if you are experiencing any challenges um, uh, feel free to write them in the chat box and uh, and again we're going to follow up separately with the audience to um, um, or with the selected individuals uh, we're going to receive those uh, uh, those consulting hours so again five hours one hour to five organizations if you if you feel like you need that, um, then this is a great opportunity for you. Okay, great. Um, so while we open up the poll, um, I want to take at least one or two questions. So uh, um, just going for the question. So bear with me a second. Um, uh, we talked a lot about uh, about tools, but uh, uh, we didn't mention specific tools. So, for week or Lucia, maybe you want to talk about specific tools that you've uh, uh, that you've advised customers to use, or you've seen customers using the transition to CI/CD. Yeah, sure. I can mention some tools. Um... I think it depends on if you manage your own infrastructure. Uh, in this kind of teams, we have seen that most of the times they, they prefer to use Jenkins and different open source solutions. In some other cases, if the company is more cloud-based uh, focused, they, they are used to use uh, cloud-based uh, solutions. Uh, we have worked with Cyclo CI or CI. I don't remember which other, but uh, there are so many different tools and they more or less provide the, the same kind of capabilities and integrations with different tools. And probably this is the, the, the most important thing to take into consideration to, to think about which different ver ver automatic verifications you want to, to do in your pipeline and verify if the continuous integration engine is able to integrate with, with those. And uh, well, then we could talk about, I don't know, different automation tools and uh, or, or talking about getting feedback from users there are different APMs like New Relic, Dynatrace, um, and App Dynamics. Those are uh, tools that we have used. Uh, we are being using. Um, we, we are using uh, for for uh, getting information about, related to the performance of the application. We are also using in some projects uh, a tool which is really cool, which is called Baxnar, which uh, allows you to get the information about the errors that the users are getting in their browsers. So this is this kind of tools are, are very useful to to you know deploy something and get instant feedback about what errors are uh, are there in in the application. Um, I know. Do, do you want to add anything else? There's definitely loads. Uh, thinking of automation, uh, you use like tools like Selenium. If you're doing mobile tools like um, Appium to involve tests like that. Uh, I think it's important to take into consideration what the company has in place already, because uh, maybe adding CI is new, but they already do have a suite of automated checks that they have in place. So you might not want to replace all of that. The same thing goes for performance, right? Maybe you're already doing some things with tools like JMeter. Um, so you want to think of a server that's going to allow you to uh, integrate all that, as you mentioned before. Great. We're, we're already out of time. So uh, so first of all, I want to thank you, uh, Lucia and Federico, for taking the time and sharing your experience. I want to thank the audience. Um, I see that uh, over 70% uh, mentioned that they 
uh, they learn something important and, uh, and about 20% mentioned that they can't wait for the next webinar. So I'm glad uh, you found this webinar useful. We're going to uh, follow up with the recording of the webinar uh, shortly. And um, uh, we're going to follow up with the participants who, um, uh, who won the, uh, uh, the five hours consulting uh, reward. And with that, I'd like to thank you all and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.